Chapter Eleven and Twelve of the Grand Babylon Hotel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Grand Babylon Hotel by Arnold Bennett. Chapter Eleven: The Court Pawnbroker. Mister Sampson Levi wishes to see you, sir. These words, spoken by a servant to Theodore Baxole, aroused the millionaire from a reverie which had been the reverse of pleasant. The fact was, and it is necessary to insist on it, that Mr. Rexall, owner of the Grand Babylon Hotel, was by no means in a state of self-satisfaction. A mystery had attached itself to his hotel, and with all his acumen and knowledge of things in general, he was unable to solve that mystery. He laughed at the fruitless efforts of the police, but he could not honestly say that his own efforts had been less barren. The public was talking, for, after all, the disappearance of poor Dimmock's body had got noised abroad in an indirect sort of way, and Theodore Rexall did not like the idea of his impeccable hotel being the subject of sinister rumours. He wondered, grimly, what the public and the Sunday newspapers would say if they were aware of all the other phenomena, not yet common property, of Miss Spencer's disappearance, of Gilles' strange visits, and of the non-arrival of Prince Eugen of Posen. Theodore Rexall had worried his brain without result. He had conducted an elaborate private investigation without result, and he had spent a certain amount of money without result. The police said that they had a clue, but Rexall remarked that it was always the business of the police to have a clue, that they seldom had more than a clue, and that a clue without some sequel to it was a pretty stupid business. The only sure thing in the whole affair was that a cloud rested over his hotel his beautiful new toy, the finest of its kind. The cloud was not interfering with business, but, nevertheless, it was a cloud, and he fiercely resented its presence. Perhaps it would be more correct to say that he fiercely resented his inability to dissipate it. "'Mr. Sampson Levi wishes to see you, sir,' the servant repeated, having received no sign that his master had heard him. "'So I hear,' said Rexall. "'Does he want to see me personally?' He asked for you, sir. Perhaps it is Rocco he wants to see, about a menu or something of that kind. I will inquire, sir. And the servant made a move to withdraw. Stop, Rexall commanded suddenly. Desire Mr. Sampson Levi to step this way. The great stockbroker of the Kaffir Circus entered with a simple, unassuming air. He was a rather short, florid man, dressed like a typical Hebraic financier with too much watch-chain and too little waistcoat. In his fat hand he held a gold-headed cane and an absolutely new silk hat, for it was Friday, and Mr. Levi purchased a new hat every Friday of his life, holiday times only excepted. He breathed heavily and sniffed through his nose a good deal, as though he had just performed some Herculean physical labour. He glanced at the American millionaire with an expression in which a slight embarrassment might have been detected but at the same time his round, red face disclosed a certain frank admiration and good nature. "'Mr. Rexall, I believe. Mr. Theodore Rexall. Proud to meet you, sir.' Such were the first words of Mr. Sampson Levi. In form they were the greeting of a third-rate chimney-sweep, but, strangely enough, Theodore Rexall liked their tone. He said to himself that here, precisely where no one would have expected to find one, was an honest man. "'Good day.' said Rexall briefly. To what do I owe the pleasure? I expect your time is limited, answered Sampson Levi. Anyhow, mine is, and so I'll come straight to the point, Mr. Rexall. I'm a plain man. I don't pretend to be a gentleman or any nonsense of that kind. I'm a stockbroker, that's what I am, and I don't care who knows it. The other night I had a ball in this hotel. It cost me a couple of thousand and odd pounds, and, by the way, I wrote out a cheque for your bill this morning. I don't like balls, but they're useful to me, and my little wife likes them, and so we give them. Now, I've nothing to say against the hotel management as regards that ball. It was very decently done, very decently. But what I want to know is this. Why did you have a private detective among my guests? A private detective? exclaimed Rexall, somewhat surprised at this charge. Yes, Mr. Sampson Levi said firmly fanning himself in his chair, and gazing at Theodore Rexall with a direct earnest expression of a man having a grievance. "'Yes, a private detective. It's a small matter, I know, and I dare say you think you've got a right, as proprietor of the show, to do what you like in that line. 
but I've just called to tell you that I object. I've called as a matter of principle. I'm not angry. It's the principle of the thing. My dear Mr. Levi, said Raxall, I assure you that, having let the gold room to a private individual for a private entertainment, I should never dream of doing what you suggest. Straight? asked Mr. Sampson Levi, using his own picturesque language. Straight, said Raxall, smiling. There was a gent present at my ball that I didn't ask. I've got a wonderful memory for faces, and I know. Several fellows asked me afterwards what he was doing there. I was told by someone that he was one of your waiters, but I didn't believe that. I know nothing of the Grand Babylon. It's not quite my style of tavern. But I don't think you'd send one of your own waiters to watch my guests. Unless, of course, you sent him as a waiter. And this chap didn't do any waiting, though he did his share of drinking. "'Perhaps I can throw some light on this mystery,' said Raxall. "'I may tell you that I was already aware that man had attended your ball uninvited. "'How did you get to know?' "'By pure chance, Mr. Levi, and not by inquiry. "'That man was a former waiter at this hotel. "'The head-waiter, in fact. Gilles. "'No doubt you have heard of him.' "'Not I,' said Mr. Levi, positively. "'Ah,' said Raxall, "'I was informed that everyone knew Gilles, but it appears not.' Well, be that as it may, previously to the night of your ball, I had dismissed Jules. I had ordered him never to enter the Babylon again. But on that evening I encountered him here, not in the gold room, but in the hotel itself. I asked him to explain his presence, and he stated he was your guest. That is all I know of the matter, Mr. Levi, and I am extremely sorry that you should have thought me capable of the enormity of placing a private detective among your guests. This is perfectly satisfactory to me. Mr. Sampson Levi said, after a pause. I only wanted an explanation, and I've got it. I was told by some pals of mine in the city I might rely on Mr. Theodore Raxall going straight to the point, and I'm glad they were right. Now, as to that fellow Jules, I shall make my own inquiries as to him. Might I ask you why you dismissed him? I don't know why I dismissed him. You don't know? Oh, come now. I'm only asking because I thought you might be able to give me a hint why he turned up uninvited at my ball. Sorry if I'm too inquisitive. Not at all, Mr. Levi, but I really don't know. I only sort of felt that he was a suspicious character. I dismissed him on instinct, as it were. See? Without answering this question, Mr. Levi asked another. If this Jules is such a well-known person, he said, how could the fellow hope to come to my ball without being recognized? "'Give it up,' said Rexall promptly. "'Well, I'll be moving on,' was Mr. Sampson Levi's next remark. "'Good day, and thank you. I suppose you aren't doing anything in Kaffirs?' Mr. Rexall smiled a negative. "'I thought not,' said Levi. "'Well, I never touch American rails myself, and so I reckon we shan't come across each other. Good day.' "'Good day,' said Rexall politely, following Mr. Sampson Levi to the door. With his hand on the handle of the door, Mr. Levi stopped and, gazing at Theodore Rexall with a shrewd, quizzical expression, remarked, "'Strange things been going on here lately, huh?' The two men looked very hard at each other, for several seconds. "'Yes,' Rexall assented. "'Know anything about them?' "'Well, no, not exactly,' said Mr. Levi. "'But I had a fancy you and I might be useful to each other. I had a kind of fancy to that effect.' "'Come back and sit down again, Mr. Levi,' Rexall said, attracted by the evident straightforwardness of the man's tone. "'Now, how can we be of service to each other? I flatter myself I'm something of a judge of character, especially financial character, and I tell you, if you'll put your cards on the table, I'll do ditto with mine.' "'Agreed,' said Mr. Sampson Levi. "'I'll begin by explaining my interest in your hotel. I've been expecting to receive a summons from a certain Prince Eugen of Posen to attend him here.' and that summons hasn't arrived. It appears that Prince Eugen hasn't come to London at all. Now, I could have taken my dying davy that he would have been here yesterday at the latest. Why were you so sure? Question for question, said Levi. Let's clear the ground first, Mr. Rexall. Why did you buy this hotel? That's a conundrum that's been puzzling a lot of our fellows in the city for some days past. Why did you buy the Grand Babylon? And what's the next move to be? "'There is no next move,' answered Rexall candidly. "'And I will tell you why I bought the hotel. There need be no secret about it. "'I bought it because of a whim. 
and then Theodore Rexall gave this little Jew, whom he had begun to respect, a faithful account of the transaction with Mr. Felix Babylon. "'I suppose,' he added, "'you find a difficulty in appreciating my state of mind when I did the deal.' "'Not a bit,' said Mr. Levi. "'I once bought an electric launch on the Thames in a very similar way, and it turned out to be one of the most satisfactory purchases I ever made. "'Then it's a simple accident that you own this hotel at the present moment.' A simple accident, all because of a beefsteak and a bottle of bars. Hm, grunted Mr. Sampson Levi, stroking his triple chin. To return to Prince Eugen, Rexall resumed. I was expecting His Highness here. The State Apartments had been prepared for him. He was due on the very afternoon that young Dimmock died. But he never came, and I have not heard why he has failed to arrive, nor have I seen his name in the papers. What his business was in London, I don't know. I will tell you said Mr. Sampson Levi. He was coming to arrange a loan. A state loan? No, a private loan. Whom from? From me, Sampson Levi. You look surprised. If you'd lived in London a little longer, you'd know that I was just the person the Prince would come to. Perhaps you aren't aware that down Throckmorton Street way I'm called the Court Pawnbroker, because I arrange loans for the minor, second-class princes of Europe. I'm a stockbroker, but my real business is financing some of the little courts of Europe. Now, I may tell you that the hereditary Prince of Posen particularly wanted a million, and he wanted it by a certain date, and he knew that if the affair wasn't fixed up by a certain time here, he wouldn't be able to get it by that certain date. That's why I'm surprised he isn't in London. What did he need a million for? Debts, answered Samson Levi laconically. His own? Certainly. "'But he isn't thirty years of age.' "'What of that? "'He isn't the only European prince "'who has run up a million of debts in a dozen years. "'To a prince the thing is as easy as eating a sandwich. "'And why has he taken this sudden resolution "'to liquidate them?' "'Because the emperor and the lady's parents "'won't let him marry till he has done so. "'And quite right, too. "'He's got to show a clean sheet "'or the princess Anna of eckstein Schwarzburg "'will never be princess of Posen.' Even now the Emperor has no idea how much Prince Eugen's debts amount to. If he had... But would not the Emperor know of this proposed loan? Not necessarily at once. It could be so managed. Twig? Mr. Sampson Levi laughed. I've carried these little affairs through before. After marriage it might be allowed to leak out. And, you know, the Princess Anna's fortune is pretty big. Now, Mr. Rexall, he added abruptly changing his tone. "'Where do you suppose Prince Eugen has disappeared to? Because if he doesn't turn up to-day, he can't have that million. To-day is the last day. To-morrow the money will be appropriated elsewhere. Of course, I'm not alone in this business, and my friends have something to say.' "'You ask me where I think Prince Eugen has disappeared to?' "'I do.' "'Then you think it's a disappearance?' Samson Levi nodded. "'Putting two and two together,' he said. I do. The Dimmock business is very peculiar, very peculiar indeed. Dimmock was a left-handed relation of the Posen family, Twig. Scarcely anyone knows that. He was made secretary and companion to Prince Herbert, just to keep him in the domestic circle. His mother was an Irish woman, whose misfortune was that she was too beautiful, Twig. Mr. Sampson Levi always used this extraordinary word when he was in a communicative mood. My belief is that Dimmock's death has something to do with the disappearance of Prince Eugen. The only thing that passes me is this. Why should anyone want to make Prince Eugen disappear? The poor little prince hasn't an enemy in the world. If he's been copped, as they say, why has he been copped? It won't do anyone any good. "'Won't it?' repeated Rexall, with a sudden flash. "'What do you mean?' asked Mr. Levi. "'I mean this.' Suppose some other European pauper prince was anxious to marry Princess Anna and her fortune. Wouldn't that prince have an interest in stopping this loan of yours to Prince Eugen? Wouldn't he have an interest in causing Prince Eugen to disappear, at any rate, for a time? Samson Levi thought hard for a few moments. Mr. Theodore Rexall, he said at length, I do believe you have hit on something. Chapter 12 Rocco and room number 111. On the afternoon of the same day, the interview just described had occurred in the morning, 
Raxall was visited by another idea, and he said to himself that he ought to have thought of it before. The conversation with Mr. Sampson Levi had continued for a considerable time, and the two men had exchanged various notions and agreed to meet again, but the theory that Reginald Dimmock had probably been a traitor to his family, a traitor whose repentance had caused his death, had not been thoroughly discussed. The talk had tended rather to continental politics, with a view to discovering what princely family might have an interest in the temporary disappearance of Prince Eugen. Now, as Raxall considered in detail the particular affair of Reginald Dimmock deceased, he was struck by one point especially, to wit, why had Dimmock and Jules manoeuvred to turn Nella Raxall out of room number 111 on that first night? That they had so manoeuvred, that the broken window-pane was not a mere accident, Raxall felt perfectly sure. He had felt perfectly sure all along, but the significance of the fact had not struck him. It was plain to him now that there must be something of extraordinary and peculiar importance about room number 111. After lunch he wandered quietly upstairs, and looked at room number 111. That is to say, he looked at the outside of it. It happened to be occupied. But the guest was leaving that evening. The thought crossed his mind that there could be no object in gazing blankly at the outside of a room. Yet he gazed. Then he wandered quickly down again to the next floor, and, in passing along the corridor of that floor, he stopped, and with an involuntary gesture stamped his foot. "'Great Scott!' he said. "'I've got hold of something. Number 111 is exactly over the state apartments.' He went to the bureau, and issued instructions that number 111 was not to be relet to anyone until further orders. At the bureau they gave him Nella's note, which ran thus. Dearest Papa, I am going away for a day or two, on the trail of a clue. If I am not back in three days, begin to inquire for me at Ostend. Till then, leave me alone. Your sagacious daughter, Nell. These few words, in Nella's large, scrawling hand, filled one side of the paper. At the bottom was a PTO. He turned over, and read the sentence, underlined. P.S. Keep an eye on Rocco. I wonder what the little creature is up to, he murmured as he tore the letter into small fragments and threw them into the waste-paper basket. Then, without any delay, he took the lift down to the basement, with the object of making a preliminary inspection of Rocco in his lair. He could scarcely bring himself to believe that this suave and stately gentleman, this enthusiast of gastronomy, was concerned in the machinations of Jules and other rascals unknown. Nevertheless, from habit, he obeyed his daughter, giving her credit for a certain amount of perspicuity and cleverness. The kitchens of the Grand Babylon Hotel are one of the wonders of Europe. Only three years before the events now under narration, Felix Babylon had had them newly installed with every device and patent that the ingenuity of two continents could supply. They covered nearly an acre of superficial space. They were walled and floored from end to end with tiles and marble, which enabled them to be washed down every morning like the deck of a man of war. Visitors were sometimes taken to see the potato-paring machine, the patent plate-dryer, the Babylon spit, a contrivance of Felix Babylon's own, the silver grill, the system of connected stockpots, and other amazing phenomena of the department. Sometimes, if they were fortunate, they might also see the artist who sculptured ice into forms of men and beasts for table ornaments, or the first napkin-folder in London, or the man who daily invented fresh designs for pastry and blancmange. Twelve chefs pursued their labours in those kitchens, helped by ninety assistant chefs, and a further army of unconsidered menials. Over all these was Rocco, supreme and unapproachable. Halfway along the suite of kitchens Rocco had an apartment of his own, wherein he thought out those magnificent combinations, those marvellous feats of succulence and originality, which had given him his fame. Visitors never caught a glimpse of Rocco in the kitchens, though sometimes, on a special night, he would stroll nonchalantly through the dining-room, like the great man he was, to receive the compliments of the hotel habitués, people of insight who recognized his uniqueness. Theodore Rexall's sudden and unusual appearance in the kitchen caused a little stir. He nodded to some of the chefs, but said nothing to anyone, merely wandering about amid the maze of copper utensils and white-capped workers. At length he saw Rocco, surrounded by several admiring chefs. Rocco was bending over a freshly roasted partridge which lay on a blue dish. He plunged a long fork into the back of the bird and raised it in the air with his left hand. In his right he held a long, glittering carving-knife. He was giving one of his world-famous exhibitions of carving. In four swift, unerring, delicate, perfect strokes 
he cleanly severed the limbs of the partridge. It was a wonderful achievement. How wondrous none but the really skilful carver can properly appreciate. The chefs emitted a hum of applause, and Rocco, long, lean and graceful, retired to his own apartment. Rexel followed him. Rocco sat in a chair, one hand over his eyes. He had not noticed Theodore Rexel. "'What are you doing, Monsieur Rocco?' the millionaire asked, smiling. "'Ah!' exclaimed Rocco, starting up with an apology. "'Pardon. I was inventing a new mayonnaise, which I shall need for a certain menu next week.' "'Do you invent these things without materials, then?' questioned Rexel. "'Certainly. I do them in my mind. I think them. Why should I want materials? I know all flavours. I think and think and think, and it is done. I write down. I give the recipe to my best chef. There you are. I need not even taste. I know how it will taste. It is like composing music. The great composers do not compose at the piano. I see, said Rexel. It is because I work like that that you pay me three thousand a year, Rocco added gravely. Heard about Jules? said Rexel abruptly. Jules? Yes, he's been arrested in Ostend, the millionaire continued, lying cleverly at a venture. They say that he and several others are implicated in a murder case, the murder of Reginald Dimmock. Truly, drawled Rocco, scarcely hiding a yawn. His indifference was so superb, so gorgeous, that Rexel instantly divined that it was assumed for the occasion. It seems that, after all, the police are good for something, but this is the first time I ever knew them to be worth their salt. There is to be a thorough and systematic search of the hotel tomorrow. Rexel went on. I have mentioned it to you to warn you that so far as you are concerned, the search is, of course, merely a matter of form. You will not object to the detectives looking through your rooms. Certainly not. And Rocco shrugged his shoulders. I shall ask you to say nothing about this to anyone, said Rexel. The news of Jules' arrest is quite private to myself. The papers know nothing of it. You comprehend? Rocco smiled in his grand manner, and Rocco's master thereupon went away. Rexel was very well satisfied with the little conversation. It was perhaps dangerous to tell a series of mere lies to a clever fellow like Rocco, and Rexel wondered how he should ultimately explain them to this great master chef if his and Nella's suspicions should be unfounded and nothing came of them. Nevertheless, Rocco's manner a strange elusive something in the man's eyes, had nearly convinced Rexel that he was somehow implicated in Gilles' schemes, and probably in the death of Reginald Dimmock and the disappearance of Prince Eugen of Posen. That night, or rather about half-past one the next morning, when the last noises of the hotel's life had died down, Rexel made his way to room 111 on the second floor. He locked the door on the inside and proceeded to examine the place, square foot by square foot, Every now and then some creak or other sound startled him, and he listened intently for a few seconds. The bedroom was furnished in the ordinary splendid style of bedrooms at the Grand Babylon Hotel, and in that respect called for no remark. What most interested Rexel was the flooring. He pulled up the thick oriental carpet and peered along every plank, but could discover nothing unusual. Then he went to the dressing-room and finally to the bathroom, both of which opened out of the main room but in neither of these smaller chambers was he any more successful than in the bedroom itself. Finally he came to the bath, which was enclosed in a panelled casing of polished wood, after the manner of baths. Some baths have a cupboard beneath the taps, with a door at the side, but this one appeared to have none. He tapped the panels, but not a single one of them gave forth that curious hollow sound which usually betokens a secret place. Idly he turned the cold tap of the bath, and the water began to rush in. He turned off the cold tap and turned on the waste tap, and as he did so his knee, which was pressing against the panelling, slipped forward. The panelling had given way, and he saw that one large panel was hinged from the inside and caught with a hasp also on the inside. A large space within the casing of the end of the bath was thus revealed. Before doing anything else, Rexel tried to repeat the trick with the waste tap, but he failed. It would not work again nor could he in any way perceive that there was any connection between the rod of the waste tap and the hasp of the panel. Rexel could not see into the cavity within the casing, and the electric light was fixed and could not be moved about like a candle. He felt in his pockets, and fortunately discovered a box of matches. 
aided by these, he looked into the cavity and saw nothing. Nothing except a rather large hole at the far end, some three feet from the casing. With some difficulty he squeezed himself through the open panel, and took a half-kneeling, half-sitting posture within. There he struck a match, and it was a most unfortunate thing that in striking, the box being half open, he set fire to all the matches, and was half smothered in the atrocious stink of phosphorus which resulted. One match burned clear on the floor of the cavity, and, rubbing his eyes, Raxall picked it up, and looked down the hole which he had previously described. It was a hole apparently bottomless, and about eighteen inches square. The curious part about the hole was that a rope ladder hung down it. When he saw that rope ladder, Raxall smiled the smile of a happy man. The match went out. Should he make a long journey, perhaps to some distant corner of the hotel, for a fresh box of matches? Or should he attempt to descend that rope ladder in the dark? He decided on the latter course, and he was the more strongly moved thereto, as he could now distinguish a faint, a very faint, tinge of light at the bottom of the hole. With infinite care he compressed himself into the well-like hole, and descended the ladder. At length he arrived on firm ground, perspiring, but quite safe, and quite excited. He saw now that the tinge of light came through a small hole in the wood. He put his eye to the wood, and found that he had a fine view of the state bathroom, and through the door of the state bathroom into the state bedroom. At the massive marble-topped washstand in the state bedroom a man was visible, bending over some object which lay thereon. The man was Rocco. End of chapter 11 and 12